This is a video about the fascinating facts about B amino acids. What is the first thought that comes to your mind when you hear the word amino acids? So they are biomolecules having an amino group as well as a carboxyl end. So amino acids have got varieties of functions. We hear that amino acids are, uh, you know, they are the methylating agents. They are universally present. Uh, amino acids are also part of several significant metabolic pathways like uh, TCA cycle, urea cycle. Um, amino acids also have got the function of uh, a function of acting as neurotransmitters. They have the capacity to either to increase the activity or to decrease in the firing of neurons. Uh, these amino acids, you know that with the loss of a molecule of water, they are able to form peptide bonds. And as we know, peptide bonds are significant in the formation of the polymer proteins. It is interesting for us to know how these amino acids came into existence somewhere around 4000 to about 3000 millions of years ago these amino acids must have been formed through chemical synthesis from roughly about 3500 millions of years ago biochemical pathways were formed in living organisms so a pathway was devised for the synthesis of every amino acid. What has happened over a period of time? So about 1800 millions of years to till these days, some of these pathways got modified. So some of these different regulatory mechanisms established for some of these amino acids. So this is the history of the development of the formation of amino acids. Nitrogen, which is present in the atmosphere, it comes into living system only through nitrogen fixation by bacteria. Now nitrogen, uh, this fixed nitrogen is slowly converted into amino acids and we get our amino acid exclusively through diet. There are two important enzymes. The two important enzymes are one is glutamate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase. Another ex en en enzyme is glutaminase synthetase. These two enzymes are so important, and these two enzymes are capable of. Uh, synthesizing you know glutamate and glutamine and they become carriers of amino group these two enzymes are used for transferring ammonia to either to glutamate or to glutamine so glutamate and glutamine becomes transported of ammonia by using these Several carbon skeleton can be converted to amino acids in living system. As we have seen a little while ago, there are different metabolic pathways for synthesizing amino acids. Some amino acids have only a single pathway, for example, tryptophan. It has got highly regulated, very expensive, a single pathway for its synthesis. Some amino acids have got several pathways. For example, lysine has got about six different pathways existing in living system. Why some amino acids have got only a single pathway? One argument given is it's a kind of a selection process. In the primitive life, some of these amino acids were plenty. So therefore, there must have been, there must have been an easy uptake of this amino acid possible. If an amino acid is abundant for uptake, these genes are under selective pressure and these genes are ex not expressed. So when a gene is not expressed, what can happen is 
they can get mutated and this gene may be utilized for uh, converting into a different pathway. This can be the reason why certain amino acids have only a single pathway. When you look at amino acids, we can categorize them into different groups. Now, for example, um, there are five different functional groups in amino acid. There are certain amino acid with a hydroxyl group. So, hydroxyl group, for example, serine, threonine, etc. are having a hydroxyl functional group. There are certain amino acid with a thiol functional group, that is an SH group. Cysteine is one such. Cysteine is one such amino acid. There are certain amino acid with a, a sulfide group. So, for example, that is SR, for example, methionine has got a sulfide functional group. There are certain amino acid that has got a guanidyl group. Guanidyl group. So, a guanidyl group will be NH, uh, C, NH2, NH. A classic example is arginine is having a guanidyl group. In the fourth category, will be having a phenyl group. So, a phenyl group will be, it will have a, a ring, a phenyl group. Examples like tryptophan, tyrosine, etc. are uh, example of a, a phenyl group, having a phenyl group as a functional group. So, these are the different uh, functional groups that are present in, in amino acids. Having said all these, now let us see how many such amino acids are being identified. Now remember that discovery of amino acid began in the early 1800s and that took about 120 years to discover all the amino acids. As we know today, there are 20 standard amino acids. Out of the 20 amino acids, 19 of them are with the primary amino group. Okay? And only one is with a secondary amino group and that is proline. So this is one classification, one understanding of amino acid. Now, as we have seen earlier that these amino acids must come into our system through diet. We are capable of synthesizing about 10 amino acids and these 10 amino acids are what we call non-essential amino acid. Non-essential amino acid because we are capable of synthesizing. There are about 8 of them we have to depend on our diet. We have to depend on either, either plant sources for these eight amino acids. They are called essential amino acids. And then there are about the two amino acids which are semi-essential amino acid. Semi-essential because these two amino acids are required especially in growing children. So they we call them semi-essential that makes it about 20 standard amino acid. In the year 2000, Box in year 2000 discovers a new amino acid that is selenocysteine. Selenocysteine. And in the year 2002, Srinivasan et al. Srinivasan, that is in 2002, discovers another amino acid and that is pyrolysin. Pyrolysin. The interesting fact is this pyrolysin is present exclusively in archaea. We began this discussion by talking about the D amino acids. One of the interesting aspects about amino acid is amino acids are, are uh, you know, they are chiral compounds. What exactly are chiral compounds? Let us write the structure of an amino acid. So NH2 this is the C alpha, this is the carboxyl end, so this has got a hydrogen, another hydrogen. So, 
this carbon is connected if it is connected to four different groups so here if it is connected to an R if it is connected to four different groups we say that this is a chiral carbon now 19 amino acids are chiral only one of them is a chiral that is glycine because of the chirality the amino acids will exist in L form as well as in the B form all naturally existing proteins will have either L form of amino acids if the B forms are found in nature but in selected locations for example you find in the B form of amino acid in certain uh, bacterial products like vasopressin or in the peptidoglycan layer of bacteria that has got D-glutamine and D-alanine maybe in the flax seed in some of the products it has got the D amino acid now what scientists have observed is this DL form over a period of time it can be converted to either D form of the amino acid how it will be converted to the D form that is depending on uh, when the protein is almost dead depending on high temperature and alkaline pH will convert in the L form of the amino acid to the D form what is observed is among all these amino acid aspartic acid aspartic acid has the tendency to convert in the L form into the D form and this conversion at one point of time it becomes the ratio becomes it becomes 50-50 50 50 so that will be the ratio so that ratio we say that it is racemization racemization so racemization of aspartic acid occurs at high temperature and at uh, uh, high alkaline pH now the racemization it is a slow process what is observed in the case of aspartic acid is the racemization rate constant is about 8.29 into 10 raised to minus 4 per year. This is the rate constant for aspartic acid. Now, which means we should understand that racemization happens, uh, it, is, it will not happen in, in active proteins biologically active protein it will not happen for example you take hemoglobin in the half life of the hemoglobin the lifespan of hemoglobin is about 120 days so and at this rate racemization cannot occur racemization occurs in dead proteins so this has been this has a lot of uh, biological significance what are the biological significance of this racemization so they have observed that uh, this racemization process can be utilized in order to determine either, uh, either lifespan of a particular species. One important aspect of racemization is it increases with the age. So they have looked at a certain, certain proteins. For example, they took the enamel, teeth enamel they took. So in the teeth enamel, they try to find what is the rate of racemization happening in the teeth enamel. They took all the teeth and they, they digested and they tried to find the racemization that is happening in the teeth. What they observed is about 8% of the total aspartic acid is getting racemized in about 60 years period in the teeth. So based on this observation, they tried to analyze a lot of sample and then they came to the conclusion that this is the rate constant for racemization of aspartic acid. So this has been used for determining in the age of organisms. Another interesting example of uh, uh, in the use of racemization is in determining in the age of uh, bowhead whale. So, so bowhead whale there were a lot of confusion 
what is the lifespan of a bowhead whale whether it is 100 years 200 years 300 years what they have done in the case of bowhead whale they took protein from the eye now we know that in the eye is made up of different layers in the bowhead whales like in the layers of an onion or in the trunk of a tree if the oldest layer is in the middle then new layers are formed out, outside this is the latest newest and this is the oldest so they took this protein in the lens protein now from this lens protein they tried to understand the racemization pattern in the bowhead whale and they tried to calculate the age lifespan of whales and they concluded that it roughly lives for about 200 years what we have done in this video is we began with the understanding certain facts about amino acid then we slowly moved into the B amino acid and we tried to understand what are some of the applications of in the B amino acid which occur in living system especially in understanding the age of fossils